And I think this is actually something that a lot of governments do a lot is is look at the kinds of trips people are taking and they tend to be pretty short. They tend to be under a mile. And you know, mile long trips you can you know often do by walking and easily do by by uh, biking. And when, we, and when we say that, when we say those short trips, you have to think of that habitual driver because it's just automatic. It's like I drive everywhere. It's like, well, wait a minute. You're literally driving to the end of the block. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And one of the things I did that I, I thought was pretty compelling with all four types of drivers is tell these little vignettes. Oh yeah, Jessica is a habitual driver. You know, eats the bowl of cereal, takes her keys out from the front table and drives. (laughs) It's just boom, boom, boom. Jessica drives all day, every day. Jessica drives to work, to school, to the grocery store, to visit friends, to see her parents, to go to the gym, to church. As is true for all habitual drivers, her car is woven into her life like the milk she pours over her breakfast cereal. We just... We just do it. We just do it. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Simmerman, and that was Kathy Tuttle. Uh, Kathy lives in Portland, Oregon, is a board member of Bike Loud PDX, and is a consultant working in the arena of climate change, uh, <laughs> understanding the impact that cars have on our society. And Kathy recently published a car master plan for Portland, which includes four different types of drivers. You are not going to want to miss this. So let's get right to it with Kathy Tuttle. I am so delighted to have online with me here today, Kathy Tuttle. Kathy, how are you? I'm doing really well. Thanks, John. Thanks so much for inviting me onto your show. I appreciate it. I love watching the episodes. Fantastic. Well, it's so wonderful to have you here. And uh, you and I first connected a few years ago when you were living in Seattle, but you're not in Seattle anymore. Uh, Why don't you just take a moment to introduce yourself to the audience? Sure. I'm Kathy Tuttle, and I'm probably uh, well known in the kind of active transportation world for forming an organization called Seattle Neighborhood Greenways. I'm living in Portland now, but in Seattle, I started this organization about 10 years ago uh, that specifically is focused on making sure that streets are livable for people using all modes of transportation. And it's turned into a real powerhouse of an advocacy organization. But I decided to take on some new challenges in in Portland. I have a PhD in urban design and planning, and I do uh, consulting work in urban design and planning, specifically in placemaking. Uh, I've worked for many years for the city of Seattle, so I understand things from a city perspective as well as from an advocate's perspective. And actually, they're kind of these three-legged stools, the the advocate perspectives, the city government perspective. I also run for elected office. I never served in elected office, but I understand the challenges of elected office having run for city council in Seattle. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I love that background. And and you also studied physics, too. Oh, I studied so many things. I'm, I'm just one of these people that just wants to learn everything. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yes, you, you were with the Seattle organization when you and I first connected. And unfortunately, we didn't have the opportunity to meet in person when I was in Seattle, most recently for the, uh, the CNU, the Congress for the New Urbanism uh, that took place. And I think it was 2017 if i'm thinking back you know it, it well enough uh but you're now so so you're in in portland and what hit my radar screen was a, a particular uh document that you pulled together and and something that you pulled together and we'll talk about that later but i, I want to first talk about the fact that you didn't waste long you didn't you didn't let the grass grow over your feet at all you you hit the ground there in in portland and and got in, engaged and involved and uh, joined the board of bike loud pdx what's this all about that's a really interesting group with a whole slew of terrific advocates it's all volunteer uh, but the goal of bike loud pdx is to hold the city of portland accountable for the three plans that the City Council of Portland approved and the Transportation Department wrote uh, that say the that 25% of all trips should be by bicycle 
in the year 2030, which is really ambitious, although not as ambitious as you know, Northern Europe and, and the Netherlands, but still it's, it's a really important climate goal. 25% of all trips are by bicycle in 2030. And that had been has been written into the, of course, the bicycle master plan, but also the climate action plan uh, and the master plan for transportation generally for the city of Portland. And the 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 focus of this Bike Loud PDX is to say, city, you you created these three master plans. Let's you know do the actions necessary to ensure that all th- you know that, that that goal is reached by 2030. Right. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, master plans <laughs> because that's that's what we're going to talk about. But I'll also pop over to the Pedal Pedal Palooza uh, calendar. Um, what is Pedal Palooza? What a great name! <laughs> what a terrific name! And actually, the founder of uh, of Pedal Palooza is on the also on the board of Bike Loud, Megan Sinok, and uh, it's a it's a festival basically of great. Um, bicycle events. It's not just, you know, an occasional, I mean, the thing that it's probably best known for is there's a naked bike ride, you know, with 10,000 people. I'm I'm not going to take part in it, but 10,000 people riding around Portland at night with no clothes on. And, but there's just like, you know, I lead policy rides for this because I'm a policy wonk. So I lead, you know, I, I just led a ride with Tony Jordan of the Park, Parking Reform Network talking about parking policy. And actually last week I led a ride with Peter Kuntz uh, uh, in the Portland Bureau of Transportation about signal policy. And we just rode around to different places. Last night I went on a ride about why streets were named after after colonialists in, you know, in Portland, and so so every every day there's a there's this whole smorgasbord of ten to fifteen on weekends, sometimes twenty five rides that you can choose from that you know meet your need to ride naked on a bicycle to learn about policy from you know wonky people like me and everything in between you know party rides. Later today, I'm going on a ride that is starting off with the organization 350, looking at tree canopy. And then later I'm going to go to a Taylor Swift ride. I mean, it's that kind of festival thing. <laughs> it's so wonderful. And it lasts for three full months, all of June, all of July, all of August. Yeah. In fact, let's let's scroll into the calendar. <laughs> yeah, look at all these <laughs> events and all these things that are going on. So yeah. And and, and then, you know, the other thing is bike loud uh, board members are extremely active in Pedal Palooza. Got it. Uh, I think of the rides, I think there are about 550 rides Bike Loud board members are, are putting on about 100 of them. Yeah. So we're really active, actively trying to engage people to take the streets, own the streets and do it by bicycle. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. When you look back on your time in Seattle, um, did it have that same sort of vibe or was it a different vibe over there in terms of you know, around the bike and all of that? Well, we, we always tried to get that that uh, uh, voluntary celebration feel in mm-hmm. Seattle, but never really accomplished it. Now, there's an organization in Seattle called Cascade Bicycle Club that does a lot of free daily rides. Right. And I, I led some rides with them, but they tend to be the kinds of rides that people go on simply for the most part to get exercise. You know, they'll go, uh, you know, do to, you know, climb a mountain and go back down a hill. You know, I mean, they're, they're, they're not the, the, the celebration of, of being joyful in community on a bike. Right. Um, and, you know, they're completely legitimate. I mean, you want to have people exercising on a bike, but the feeling that I got on Cascade Bicycle Club rides was, you know, people skied in the winter and they rode their bikes in the, in the summer. Yeah. And getting that, that community feel to, to biking was something that, Seattle Neighborhood Greenways attempted, uh, but it, you know, it didn't, it doesn't still have that kind of pedal palooza feel to it. And certainly not at the, the, the extent that pedal palooza has, which is just these, you know, just growing number of, of things, which are so appropriate during COVID because, you know, this is where you're meeting your community. This is where you're celebrating with your community and exercising with them in a, in a pretty COVID free environment because you're outside on a bike. Yeah. Um, so, so the Seattle advocacy, you know, tended to be more 
cerebral, less active, less, you know, I mean, Seattle Neighborhood Greenways did policy walks and rides, but not to the extent that, that this celebration does. Right. With, yeah. On, on the kind of, the, again, policy and, and, you know, changing government. Yeah. So going back to, to Bike Loud uh, PDX, uh, the fact that uh, you guys are, you know, sort of very, very clear that what the purpose is, is to hold the city accountable to these these three master plans um, and, and the goals that are being set forth. Um, talk a little bit about how that works. I mean, how do you actually hold the city accountable for these types of things? Well, it's paying attention to, you know, every time a new street is put into into place, you know, does it include bike lanes? Every time new uh, stations are rolled out for bike share, do they have sufficient bikes available? Are there training programs happening from the city level or is the city supporting that? Is the city supporting a really robust program of safe, safer routes to school for, for children who want to walk and bike? And it's also, you know, so it's it's all of the, the various things that influence people to make the change of you know, occasionally biking or biking during the summer with Pedalpalooza to, to incorporating biking as an everyday part of their lives and making sure that the infrastructure exists for it and that people are trained sufficiently so that it feels comfortable for them to do it. Yeah. And the fact that you have that experience of having worked for a city, as well as the, you know, the experience of having run your own advocacy organization, I mean, that's, that's tremendously uh, helpful, I think, to a, a, a new organization that you kind of join um, and become a board member of because you're able to bring, you know, those perspectives, you know, to to the table and to, and to the organization. I like to say, too, that um, when we look at the the structure of how things, you know, sort of get done uh, in, in regards to advocacy and activism and uh and really the change that has to happen you know we we obviously we have at the very very top is is you know the politicians and then the city staff especially the director level and then the staff that they have underneath them then you have an the advocacy organizations that are sort of working with the city sort of <laughs> outreach to the politicians and the leaders and, you know, and, and maybe kind of holding accountable the, the city, quote unquote, the city in, in, in quotations. Um, and then there's the another group that I like to call the activists. <laughs> and 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 then, of course, then there's the community. But those well, four groups interrupt you and yeah. you don't get the group that you are in, which is basically the fourth estate. I mean, you are mm -hmm. the storytellers, you know, you are in, right. in Portland, it's Bike Portland, it's the media, it's, and right. you're telling stories about things too. That's a, that's an integral kind of glue of the whole, of the yeah. whole picture. What, what's interesting is I feel like you, you have to be a city has to sort of be firing on all cylinders. You have to have, you know, a, a little bit of the activists that are are not trying to necessarily worry about having uh, a productive relationship with the city. Uh, they're just like, no, you don't you don't understand. We're going to lay down in the middle of the street here because we are sick and tired of this happening. Whereas that's not necessarily possible with all advocacy organizations, especially if you have a long time uh, ongoing relationship with the city. Maybe you know some advocacy organizations, literally their staff salaries are, are tied to contracts with the city to maybe do bike ed programs and things of that nature. So um, I, I do like to say that, you know, yeah, you got to have your leadership, you got to have strong staff and you've got to have strong advocacy organizations and you, you do need to have that sort of edgy activism, whether it's a critical mass or whether it's, you know, people that are willing to, you know, protest, you know, out on the streets and say, now, and obviously there's a little bit of overlap and a little bit of <laughs> mixing and mingling because uh, sometimes I have my advocacy hat or excuse my activism hat. And then sometimes I'm wearing my, you know, advocacy 
And sometimes they staff show up for a, you know an advocacy event. I think you're very very smart though to, to divide up the the activism into or advocacy into kind of the you know the the traditional role of you know staff supported advocacy and the and the the activists who are you know, willing to take the streets as it were uh, because they are very different roles and they are beholden to different constituencies and they do have different impacts but they're all important. And the other thing that, you know, you have to remember with all of these, too, is they're all people, you know, with their own, you know, issues, their own desires, their own need to have a better world that they're leaving for their children or, you know, whatever. I mean, people have motivations that as people, no matter which of those positions they're in, and yet you need to take those into account. And and that's exactly where I wanted to go with this is to talk about the fact that the the other critical factor is the masses you know how do you the the community as a whole and how do you get to that point of engagement of a community uh you know all the way to the point of like the the education and the awareness and getting them motivated to speak up for change to vote people into office, you know, that, that are going to move things along. Speak to that a little bit, because I think that's one of the biggest challenges uh, when we, we think about our democracy and how do you activate a community to actually care about this stuff? I think, you know, and this is something I've noticed very strongly in Portland is, you know, as you said, you need the, the politicians or the kind of decision makers that could be business people or make, you know, in charge of the politicians um, you, on board. You need the uh, advocacy organizations and you need the government staff. And in Portland, there are some government staff that are on board. Uh, there are this huge kind of pedal palooza activism group on board, as well as, you know, other groups. But the thing that we don't have here is the, um, uh, there's no, no uh, uh, political uh, support for biking, uh, and that's a, that's a real loss. And the the way that you actually change that is by um, helping to uh, k- kind of framing a a uh, a decision that people can make to vote on. I mean, actually having a vision. And this is something that that uh, Portland hasn't had. Uh, for a while is that kind of vision of, yes, we want to get to that city that is much more walkable, the city that has 25% of people biking. And I think once you get these compelling visions and ways of achieving those visions, then you can start electing leaders that will also support those visions. And that, that hasn't been around. I think Portland represented that very strongly, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, when they stopped some freeways going through the center of town. It's starting to pick that back up again, but it's something that's missing, that isn't missing in Seattle. I think that politicians there, there's a a number of people on the city council that actually are strong advocates for uh, making a more climate resilient, walkable, bikeable city that Portland doesn't have yet. It's it's interesting sort of comparing the two cities since I've only been in Portland for a year uh, and seeing that lack and and looking at how to move that forward. And I think what has been missing is that compelling vision of what could be different. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pulling up your little graphic here from uh, from when you ran for office. And when it comes to yeah, when it comes to this this concept of, OK, we have to we have to start electing, um, you know, representatives that, you know, are actually sort of um, you know, caring about these things and, and talk a little bit about the platform that you ran on and you, you just made that comparison of, of the fact that, yeah, it, there's, that's one of the things that's sort of missing right now in Portland is that, uh, that leadership at the political level. Oh, the thing that's missing is, is the compelling argument that, you know, we are in a climate emergency and that we are in a kind of a, a you know, an existential political emergency and that we need to take action to, to make changes for it. Um, you know, I mean, I'm an old hippie, you know, I go, I mean, you can see, you know, I'm ancient there. I, I put my, 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 uh, my carbon timeline at the bottom of my, uh, my campaign. Yeah, yeah. 
along the bottom. It's all the, you know, what, what the parts per million were, uh, you know, when I was born until right. till now. And, you know, the, the, the things that we really value, which are, you know, the trees and the recycling and the neighborhoods and all of those things are, are considered kind of passe and, and, you know, not important anymore. And I think that we need to, to start reconnecting with each other and start saying these are things that we really value as people, that we really value um, as a community, and these are the things that are going to pull us through the emergencies that are that are coming forward. I think the thing that, you know, I, I think that, you know, Portland is, is really moving forward a lot on housing, although we have a ton of unhoused people, but and as far as changing legislation for it, because right. I think there is a clear vision of where we want to be. We want to be a compassionate city that houses all neighbors uh, in all kinds of housing all over the city. And I think that that's something that, you know, we can pull along as a thread to change the city and to change the structure. But we also need the the equity that people get by not needing to own a car. We right. need people to be able to do their everyday uh, activities, getting their kids to school, shopping, visiting their neighbors without getting in a car. We need to have, you know, really robust transportation systems, great ways, you know, very walkable, you know, marketing and grocery stores and uh, extremely protected bike lanes to get people to the, the places they need to go to. That's how you get this 25% mode split is by making things uh, safe enough and, and compelling and, and you, know, uh, the, you know, the obvious choice for getting around. And Portland doesn't have that yet. It's not the obvious choice for getting around here. Yeah. Although yeah. I'm far from here, but, but it's, it's, it's more of a challenge than it should be. So you mentioned 350. Ah. What's that all about? So 350 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere is considered the top level of um, that CO2 gas or CO2 equivalent gas that can be in the atmosphere in order for the temperature not to rise uh, to levels that are unsustainable for human life in most of right. the world. And so if we zoom in, <laughs> that was 2011, 356. <laughs> yeah, I believe we're up to about uh, 421 now. Wow. Which, which is terrifying. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it is terrifying. Yeah. You know? and we need to be as, a, as, as you know, individual individuals, as individual neighborhoods, as communities, as countries, as the world. Uh, very aware of where we are and and doing everything we can to mitigate that that climate emergency and yeah. that includes you know one of the biggest you know most obvious things is overconsumption but also cars. Yeah. Um, we need to be controlling cars. And controlling well, what's, what's interesting too for me is that um, in both my interviews with uh, with Dr. Dick Jackson and uh, with Dale Bracewell. Um, uh, they're at the city of Vancouver. He's, he's recently announced his, his retirement, um, yeah. moving on. Um, but both of them were just like, where's the sense of urgency? We need to be moving forward with a sense of urgency. And it sounds like that's exactly what you all are trying to bring forward and hold this, the city accountable to is where's that sense of emergency. These are in your plans. How are we moving forward? We need to move forward quicker. Uh, we have no choice, you know, I, uh, and Portland experienced the hottest weather, weather it's ever had uh, in last year, last summer, at exactly this time, we had something called a heat dome, you know, once in every thousand year experience where the temperatures went up to 110 or 12 in just in, in the general, you know, air, and then 120 in some urban heat islands. And they did things like melt trolley lines and buckle asphalt. I mean, the people who are making asphalt now for the for the streets are actually changing their blend. So it's closer to the Arizona blend so that it doesn't buckle in future heat emergencies because we had 100 degrees yesterday. And, you know, the temperatures are continuing to rise in incredibly rapidly, much more rapidly than anybody expected when we started studying this 20, 30 years ago. Uh, and that's the emergency. You know, we are not going to be able to afford to to replace the infrastructure, among other things. You know, people do, 
you know, 58 people died last last year in the Portland heat dome, but we are not going to be able to to replace the um, the infrastructure that's just going to crumble through all sorts of climate emergencies, whether they're they're the you know floods and the hurricanes and the extreme weather and the extreme heat and the you know Yellowstone roads washing out. I mean, the simple fact that we will not be able to replace the or you know the bridges that are are going to be failing because of all of these emergencies means that we're going to have to suddenly pay attention. Yeah. Hence. A car, a car master plan. So we were talking about the plans, these three plans that uh, that that the city of Portland has, and how um, the Bike Lab PDX um, organization is trying to hold them accountable to those plans that they already have. The first time I heard of a city needing to have an effective car master plan. Um, I believe I was actually in the Netherlands on a study tour. In I can't remember who actually said it. I've I've heard other people saying it before, quipping. I, I'm I'm pretty sure that Chris Bruntlett has said it before in the sense that you know the the magic to a, an amazing you know cycle network plan is to have an effective car master plan. Really, you know, making the point that you know we have this pedestrian master plan, we have the you know the the bike master plans. Where is the city's car master plan in the sense rather than just allowing, oh yeah, well of course cars are going to be able to go everywhere and and it's they're going to be you know, ubiquitous and there really is no control <laughs> or vision to it. It just kind of uh it just kind of is amorphous and takes over. That's sort of my take on it. What was your take on it? What was your your real motivation of uh, why a city needs a car master plan? Well, I've worked on a number of plans. I mean, I'm a planner. I've reviewed hundreds of plans professionally and personally. But uh, and you know, I've worked on bike plans and pedestrian plans and transit plans and climate plans and you know, on and on and on. And as you said, the, the assumption around all of those plans is that the car is always a part of it. And the car is always what's in American plans. The car is always what's going to be in the plan as kind of the default background. And that, you know, it suddenly struck me that that's really nonsense. Nobody is looking at the car as a mode, uh, looking at the car as, you know, something other than you know, the thing, the un, so, so there's, there's something in linguistics called marked language and unmarked language. So when somebody comes to, you know, repair your, uh, the things in your, in your condo, it's the handyman came. Now, if a, a, the person who comes to repair the things in your condo is a woman, you say the handy woman came and suddenly that is a marked thing. You know, you're distinguishing it from, what is always considered, you know, the, the man coming in and doing things. I mean, it's a linguistics term. Uh, and cars are the unmarked thing, the unremarkable thing that we see everywhere and that we don't even process the fact, you know, you can be looking at a beautiful setting of a park and you say, oh, that's a lovely park. You don't see the cars lined up parked on the side of the road, even though they're part of the whole landscape because we have put on these blinders not to see the car. And that's really important if we're actually talking about changing modes, if we're changing from a, a city that is, you know, you know, 80% of the, or 90% of the space is given over to cars, we should be paying a very close attention to what that 90% is, how that 90% is used. And I hadn't seen a car master plan uh, specifically calling out cars. And I wanted to learn more about cars themselves because I had been focused, have been focused for years on public space development, on you know, parks development and, and car and bike and transit uh, development. I decided to actually pay attention to the car. And I learned a lot doing this. I mean, I've been working in this field for 35 years and I learned so much about cars as objects and roads as objects, so much more about asphalt than I ever Knew that because <laughs> asphalt is everywhere. I mean, it's yes. covered, you know, twenty five percent of most cities is asphalt, 
and we don't know anything about it or, or the people who work on the asphalt do. But we as advocates, we as city employees need to know about it because it is a big part of our budgets. And it's certainly a you know, critical part of our, our kind of climate budget. You know, the CO2 produced by asphalt and by cars is, is overwhelming. Yeah, we won't have time to go through all of the different sections, but uh, real quickly, section one is the history of cars in Portland. Section two is the car streets and car parking, and you're going into uh, all those different uh, aspects of you know everything from road width to lane width to hard streets, streets for cars, etc. Section three is all about cars <laughs> and really looking at, at all of those things. Section four is car drivers, and we're going to come back to that a little bit. And then section five is, of course, the future of cars. And uh, the, one of my favorite things in, in that is uh, the, the top 10 surprises and the top 10 recommendations. Um, the thing that really caught my eye, and I think caught the eye of, of many other people, was the four types of drivers. Um, talk a little bit about that, because it, and did that surprise you that that was one of the things that sort of bubbled up and, and people grabbed on to? Um. It's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, it's a, it's a manageable number. You know, you can start to think about what are the different kinds of drivers. I mean, the thing that actually came out that was very surprising to me is how many people are not drivers, never will be drivers, cannot be drivers. Uh, I didn't expect that to be such a high number. And then the other thing that kind of surprised me is uh, how, how the, you know, what I call the entitled driver actually dominates because they are entitled drivers uh the the conversation about cars generally because i don't think entitled drivers at all represent the population they represent a quarter of the population if that Uh, but, but they still dominate you know the street use and the street use conversations and how we plan streets and speaking of loud they're loud In more than one way. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so here's here's the, the four different types. You know, we've we we can zoom in here and we see the four different types of, of, of drivers. You've got the the entitled, the habitual, the reluctant and the non-driver. And to your point, you, you know, you were a little surprised that the that non-driver, uh, you know, came in at, at that 40 percent level. Um, and we can actually you know scoot on over to, uh, you know, who these people really are. Um, Walk us through, you know, sort of peel back some of the layers here. Who are these non-drivers at 40% of the population there in Portland? So super interesting. And, and, you know, I really encourage people in other cities, as I said, I think that every city needs a car master plan, I think. And I have been talking since this came out and this, you know, I, I presented this at Portland State University, this research uh, I've heard from a number of cities around the country with people saying, how do we do some of these measurements? How do we, you know, measure the non-drivers in our city? And I, I, I'm, I'm glad that this is something people are thinking about because uh, so, so non-drivers, 40% in Portland, uh, 13% are children, uh, 13% are people with uh, disabilities that do not allow them to drive. Uh, and I, that I derive from this, you know, uh, health association, the CDC, uh, the number of people that have disabilities, and I just split it in half. I mean, certainly there are people with disabilities who are able to drive, but there are a lot of people with neurological, uh, health, uh, physical disabilities that make it nearly impossible or impossible to drive, vision, vision issues, um, and uh, and then the, the other 13 percent are the, the the people who have uh, just insufficient income to be able to drive. Right. You know, driving a car costs uh, uh, approximately ten thousand dollars a year uh, yeah. to own and maintain a car and park it and insure it and all of that stuff. So that comes up to 40 percent of all people, uh, and you know different cities you know have a higher percentage of people in poverty or a higher percentage of children, uh, the the percent of people with disabilities is probably gonna be similar in every city. The thing that I heard when I was presenting this information to various people in uh, Portland city government is why are you including children in this 40% of non-drivers? 
And, you know, I was a little taken aback by that because, of course, children have a legitimate interest in being able to use streets as public space. You know, they are walking to school. They do have, need to have the freedom of play, the, the freedom of movement. And we have denied them that freedom in a very um, terrible way, really, because we have said in order to get to a friend's house, you're going to need to be driven to a friend's house. In order to play, you're going to be playing on your computer in our house. You know, we, we've, ke we've kept public space from children. Um, and, and then I realized that the other two categories, the people with disabilities and the, and the people who are too poor to drive and children are the three um, classes of people that our government at the city and certainly at the federal level doesn't consider kind of whole people, doesn't yeah. consider legitimate, they're not voters often, or if they are voters, you know, they're, they're not, but they're not kind of economic contributors. Right. And so they don't deserve the streets. These are the 40% of people that governments have decided don't deserve access, you know, free and fair access to our streets. Right. Children, people with disabilities and people who are poor don't deserve to have access, the, the same kind of access to streets as a person in a car, you know. Yeah. You buy that ten thousand dollar annual ticket to use the streets by right. owning a car, and that seems extremely unfair and extremely biased. And it's something that I think our our whole community needs to look at carefully and say, actually, we do want that forty percent of people who with disabilities, people who have you know deep poverty and, and children to have access to our streets. I think that that's you know. Uh, one of the most overwhelming findings from this whole car master plan is that yeah. we we delegitimize people's use of the streets. How insidious that assumption was that, you know, oh, children, what do you mean? It's like, of, of course they're in the cars because they're being, clearly they're being shuttled around everywhere. <laughs> they may not be a driver, but they're a passenger. It's like that's... And yeah, and you've been to the Netherlands. You know, I, I lived for a year in Sweden. I mean, this is, you know, remarkable when you're in places that actually provide for people. You do see people, a lot more people, you know, using wheelchairs. You do see a lot more children on the street. You know, my son, when he was eight or nine years old, biked by himself to school. Right. You know, the, 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 the access that people have is, is just tremendous in, in places where, where the, you know, the government actually says, yes, we all have a right to the street. Okay. And by, by, by cutting out the, these, these 40% uh, of people, we've, we've taken away their rights to, to public space. Yeah. So at 5%, we've got our reluctant drivers. These are the folks that, uh, you know, <laughs> it speaks for itself. They're reluctant. You know, they've, they're, they're riding around in the, in the bike that says one less car. on it. It's like every once in a while I have to drive, but if I cannot do it, I'm going to ride my bike. <laughs> Talk a little bit about this group. It's, I'd love to see this, this, uh, this group uh, growing, especially from the habitual and the entitled. Yeah. I think that the, you know, I think a lot of the people who are going to be listening to your podcast are, are in this reluctant driver category. Yeah. You know, I certainly am. I have a driver's license. I renew it however often you're supposed to do it, which I think is very rarely, not nearly frequently enough. Right. And, you know, I used it to get a U-Haul because I just moved between two apartments. And But that was the last time I drove. And, you know, we have set our society up in such a way that, you know, if you have, you know, certain kinds of jobs or if you're going on a certain kind of vacation or if you're going, you know, you're, ca you're carrying things that, you know, you cannot do on transit you have and, and, and stores aren't set up to do delivery, although they are more now, uh, of the kinds of larger bulk items that you get, you have to drive. But there's so many instances where people don't need to drive where they think they do need to drive. Right. Um, and, you know, that's that's kind of showing up, too. I mean, I, I looked at a lot of, you know, what kinds of trips people are taking in Portland. And I think this is actually something that a lot of governments do a lot is is look at the kinds of trips people are taking. And they tend to be pretty short. They tend to be under a mile. And, you know, mile long trips, you can 
you know, often do by walking and easily do by, by uh, biking. And, and, when I, we, and when we say that, when we say those short trips, you have to think of that habitual driver because it's just automatic. It's like I drive everywhere. It's like, well, wait a minute. You're literally driving to the end of the block. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And one of the things I did that I, I thought was pretty compelling with all four types of drivers is tell these little vignettes. I don't know if you've had a, a chance to look at any of them, but like with a habitual driver, what do I, I say? Jessica, can you scroll in on that at the very top? Oh, it's at the top. Yeah. Uh, da, da, da. Habitual driver. Jessica. Oh, oh, yeah. Jessica is a habitual driver. You know, eats the bowl of cereal, takes her keys out from the front table and drives. <laughs> it's just boom, boom, boom. Jessica drives all day, every day. Jessica drives to work, to school, to the grocery store, to visit friends, to see her parents, to go to the gym, to church. As is true for all habitual drivers, her car is woven into her life like the milk she pours over her breakfast cereal. We just. We just do it. We just do it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, nothing really stops us until we can't afford to drive or somehow some light gets turned on. And I think getting that light turned on is the role of advocates in government because habitual drivers are where we can really make significant change. This is the other thing about looking at these four types of drivers is that reaching habitual drivers, I think, again, is the, the role of the government and kind of putting a little bit of, of, of damper on the entitled drivers is also the role of the government. But again, right. they're different approaches. And so far from what I can see is most policies, most kind of approaches that that politicians take to drivers is they look at them as one class of people, the right. driver. Right. You know, the same way that often people still are looked at as the biker, you know, the middle aged right. man, micro, is not the biker. I mean, there's a, a, you know, whole ecosystem of different kinds of bike, bike, you know, people who ride bikes for different reasons. The same is true for people who drive. Right. And I think that narrowly focusing on that would, you know, will change the messaging significantly. Yeah. And as people are habitual drivers, they build habits and you need to change those habits. I mean, that's what the, the media cam, campaigns need to be about. That's what training yeah. needs to be, out, be about. And I focused in on this because, you know, behavior change is my background. And, you know, that's really all, all about, you know, trying to help create uh, those healthy habits and that you can, you know, you can instill and you work upon that. But, you know, as this says, you know, habitual drivers simply drive because they always have because it's easy. Fuel is cheap. Parking is convenient everywhere. You know, they and, and they can just go everywhere with their cars guess what happens? You know, things happen. (laughs) Next thing you know, you wake up, it's no longer cheap. And uh, your your city suddenly gets enlightened and suddenly parking is not ubiquitous. Somebody handed them Donald Shoup's book. And the next thing you know, magic, what a, voila. (laughs) Don Don will be so happy to see that. (laughs) I want to, I want to, have you seen this one? Oh no! Yeah. Oh yeah! Look at that spots parking lot. Love it. Love it. It's a children's book inspired by Shoop's book. It's a nice. really great. That's nice, and and I think that's is so important. Is that's really the people who we have to be focused on is the habitual drivers. Um, we will see some transformation and some movement of the entitled drivers, but that's a much bigger lift to be able to break through um, that. I mean, the, the, the message that I have is that, you know, the don't focus so much energy and time on the haters. The haters are going to hate. And the reality is, too, that 25 percent of the population that is the entire or the 25 percent of the drivers, the, you know, that is the, the that 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 entitled driver is going to be harder. It's not to say that they can't make that change, but usually that has to come from within. It probably has to come from within their group or somehow they go through an awakening moment and, and, uh, and sort of have that epiphany. So, but you, you mentioned something earlier too, which is really, really important is that since they are loud, 
since they do have that sense of entitlement and since they oftentimes are quite powerful, oftentimes the leadership, city leadership spends an inordinate amount of time listening to them, being concerned about them, and shall we say, even bowing down to them. Well, uh, investing in them, putting money into the things that, that entitled drivers need, as correct. opposed to the non-drivers, most certainly. Correct. Yeah. 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 It's very, very interesting. So, well, yeah, I, I don't I, want to spend too much time talking about them. <laughs> no, I, want, I wanted to, uh, to uh, you know, get back to what you were talking about with, with you know, your your behavioral change from a public health perspective, because right. I think what you're, you're talking about is very, very important uh, as far as changing behavior for the uh, habitual driver. And, you know, how do you change behavior for a person that feels entitled in a different way uh, when you're doing health assessments and health, health behavior change? I mean, what, what would you suggest for entitled drivers other than, you know, don't listen to them as, as, as the, you know, know it alls on the road and don't, cater to their needs and, and also try to control them in a very significant way. Yeah. I think, you know, the most significant way that where we can break through when we take a look at, at behavior change is we can't be preaching to them. As soon as you start down the road of, you know, uh, of preaching and saying, this is the way that you should do, and this is what you should do. And it, it, in, in public health, in, in changing, you know, behaviors out on the streets, we have seen the imploring people to slow down and imploring people to drive carefully and imploring people to walk more and bike more and drive less. That just doesn't do it. What does do it is, you know, creating a, an environment, a situation that embraces and incentivizes and and really brings this to life what are we looking at <laughs> well we're looking at a place that probably is full of of uh entitled drivers but they're they're streets that don't allow entitled driving on them right uh -huh. i mean there's gonna be people everywhere that you know feel the sense of you know I'm allowed to drive. And these are people when, when they get outside of the boundaries of, of this, you know, delightful pedestrian space, they're probably going to get into a car and speed. That's fine. This is a pedestrian environment. This is a place, you know, a city that, that allows the movement of children, allows the movement of, of, of people in wheelchairs and other able people and elderly people. And, you know, it's a delightful place to sit. Yeah. Um, and you got to, you got to be there for a little while. What were you doing there? Oh, and where this is this? This is such a wonderful place. This is the city of Pontevedra. It's in Spain. And I was doing a tour three, four years ago of uh, pedestrian spaces in Europe just because it just, you know, is a busman's holiday kind of thing. You know, I do these kinds of things. And I expected to spend, I'd, I'd read about Pontevedra. I expected to spend like two or three days there. And I ended up spending three weeks there. <laughs> <laughs> you travel like I travel. <laughs> so wonderful. So this is a city, a very, you know, it's a city of 150,000. Downtown is about 50,000. And you can see there's a person in a wheelchair in the background. there. Yeah. Um, and here I am, like, being accompanied by the, the assistant mayor and the director of, of uh, transportation services. And somehow I got to be a celebrity in Pontevedra because I was, like, writing about it then. And But I got to meet the mayor who was first elected about 25 years ago. And he um, is a pediatrician. And he uh, said, you know, the children that are coming into my office are either obese or they have, you know, been hit by a car. And, you know, they, you know, cars are the, the root of all, you know, bad design. And he had read the Spanish translation of Jane Jacobs. And he said, we, I'm going to run on, as a pediatrician, I'm going to run on a platform of a car-free downtown Ponte Vedra. And he got elected. He was a very charming guy. And he had to convince his city staff to go along with this. And then he started pedestrianizing the downtown of Ponte Vedra, turning what had been plazas and then turned into parking lots back into plazas for people. Right. And uh, 
people just said, what are you doing? You're taking away all the cars. And he said, you know, this is what you voted for. This is how you voted for me as the, as the leader of Pontevedra. Uh, I, was, and, I was serious. I was serious. First hundred, <laughs> first hundred days, he kicked all the cars out of the downtown. He figured out how to do yeah. it. And he, I mean, a, a big lift was also getting the, the city staff to go along with it. Yeah. And, you know, working out the details is not trivial, but he figured it out, got the staff on board. And after the first hundred days, you know, as he, you know, was, was going along, people were going, why isn't my part of town car free? You know, why isn't yeah. my part of town car free? And eventually he got the whole of the downtown because everybody wanted this delightful space where people can walk and feel comfortable and the children can play in all the plazas, there's no danger of people driving and hurting pedestrians. It's mostly a pedestrian city, relatively right. little bike, you know, a little yeah. bit of bike delivery, but it's mostly a walking city. And he's been reelected uh, five times now. Yeah. So he's been, he's been mayor for 25 years. Yeah. And, fantastic. And I, you know, highly, it's, it's actually a little difficult to get to. It's just a little north of Portugal and everybody I recommend, you know, to go to it. it it's a schlep to get to. But yeah. well, and the other thing that, that because it's been a pedestrian city for 25 years and a deliberate change, the. Yeah. Um, That's the, by, the, by the way, it's the red pin up on the <laughs> upper, no. upper left. Yeah. So, yeah, you can see you know, Madrid's in the middle there. Uh, I've been down here yeah. to Seville, Sevilla. Yeah, but not. And uh, but I have not made it over to. So it's on my list. Yes, not and, for uh, this year, but next year. The other thing that that I want to kind of highlight is the in the city that they paid a lot of attention after 25 years. Uh, some industries got started alongside of it that are are um, pedestrian oriented. So there's incredible incredibly good paving, you know, modern paving that's been added to it. There's really great street furniture and great street lighting. Yeah. Um, you know, you don't sort of see it at first because, you know. Yeah, you but when you when you really pay attention and you start to focus in on the quality of what is down here, you start to see that level of craftsmanship. And and this is something the Dutch do also very, very well, and, and, and the Danes as well, is really – using the the pavers and the and the, the the stepping stones and using different materials to demarcate you know the different sections of of the of, of that environment there so yeah fantastic it's subtle, subtle but you know as as you know a human habitat you you don't yeah. maybe pay attention to it but but your body pays attention to it your brain is just says oh something's different in this yeah. place versus that place and you're so, so that that's your answer Mm -hmm. That was my answer to you is just that is it you, you create that situation. And this is actually kind of how we're able to um, to make some inroads in people who are are skeptical and 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 just like, oh, well, how do we change our behavior? If you create quality, you know, inviting environments where people are embraced and 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 they're just like, oh, that was amazing. Um, and it's it's the quintessential joke, right, is that, you know, people go away on vacation and they go to someplace wonderful and they're like, oh, my gosh, I, I just got back, from, you know, from, you know, Ponte Vedra. It was it was amazing. I just got back from Copenhagen. Oh, my gosh, the plazas and, and, and for, or Italy and da, da, da. And it's like, oh. Well, if somebody were to say, well, why don't we do that here? Oh, no, 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 no. We could never do that here. But the point is, is that you can. And that's one of the things that I've learned so much over the, over the years is that um, there is those that layering of creating an environment that is truly um, authentically inviting so that it really does feel like, oh, we're, we're talking about an all ages and abilities environment. We're, we're not going to be worried about our little one running over to here or exploring the environment. It's like, or in the case of the Dutch children mentioned earlier, you know, they routinely get themselves to school, to their friend's house, exploring the city. And it, it's, it, there's that expectation that, you know, They've developed those skills, those social ability, the, the navigation skills to be able to do all these things. 
and they're better for it. And it's so, the, the other end of life too. I mean, you know, yes, I the to- other end of life. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. This year, and one of the things I'm looking for is a place I can, you know, age in place that I can yep. walk, I can bike without fear. I mean, right now I'm extremely mobile, but I know 20 years yeah. from now, 20 years older, and I, I need a place that that you know is embracing to somebody that that is aging. And I don't think American cities are considering that. That are, they're yeah. not really considering aging in place. Yeah, and so. There's the old adage that we've talked about, uh, you know, over over the decades of build it and they will come. And there's there's something to that. Yes, you you have to build this before people can get to it, (laughs) before people can use it. But it's it's not as simple as just, you know, build that trail or build that protected bikeway and they will come. Yes, you have to build truly authentic places, but then you also have to have, and that's what I call, you know, the, the activity assets, the hardware activity assets, the parks, the pools, the places, the, you know, the, the, the trails, the protected bike lanes. These are, are things that are physical in nature in our environment and you can map them out, but you also have to have the software activity assets. You have to have the policies and the procedures and the activation events and the things that really engage people and support people. Oh, the density as well. I mean, you need to, in order to activate something, you need to have enough people around. Exactly. Yeah. Which I would say is, is, is part of, you know, sort of that policy framework of what are your land use, you know, guidelines and, 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 you know, how are you looking at transforming the built environment? Are you looking at a sea of, of asphalt (laughs) parking? Uh, nobody wants to be there. Yeah. And I mean, that, that is, you know, the, the, the best land use plan is a, you know, transportation plan, best transportation plan is a land use plan. I mean, it right. goes both ways. You need, you need both. And, you know, I mean, I have a, a background. I mean, one of the things I did for the city government of Seattle is for five years, I worked for the parks department and put in or retrofitted 40 Seattle parks. So I've learned right. a lot of activation there and, you know, the, the, you know, the more space you, you hardscape for parking lots, the fewer people are able to use those parks. Right. So yeah, you have, to, you have to provide space, but also, um, you know, in a way that, that allows people to, to have some, you know, re- places of respite, trees, benches, but then you also have to have act- activation zones. You have to be thoughtful about it yeah. on, a, on a small scale, but on a city scale, you know, you, you know, we're, we're I, I look at streets too as kind of these land banks of of possibilities. You know, we've we have tons and tons of public space in cities. We have given, you know, most American cities have given twenty to thirty, sometimes even higher percentages of their land to streets. And those streets right now are, you know, basically single purpose, right? right? single purpose of storing cars and moving cars. But in a sense, we can look at it and say, hey, we have this whole land bank of place, right? Those those streets could be as public space. They could be public housing. They could be, you know, retail. They could be parks. They could be solar banks. I mean, there's a million things that that public space, we as the public can say, we want this space to be used in a different way. And a lot of those things are activity. And, uh, you know, the, the, the single use of car space. This is actually a street in Portland. Uh, yeah. The farmer's market is there, and it's also on the campus of Pacific, uh, 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 Portland State University. But you know, one of the few pedestrian streets in downtown Portland. Uh, and it was, in the, it was in a city master plan that was written in the 1970s. You know, they wanted the, a lot of the city to be car free. But this is one but yeah you have to activate it and you have to provide a variety of experiences because not everybody wants to you know stand under the trees you know people want to play people want to do different things and we we have this land bank of so much space that we can be doing such a variety of things with and right now we're using them for two functions right moving cars and storing cars right i love this photo too it, it reinforces a, a reoccurring theme that I have here on the podcast is that um, <laughs> being forced into a pandemic uh, for cities around the globe, uh, people started seeing their streets in a different way and started 
you know, appreciating streets, especially during the, the height of the lockdown, my neighborhood, maybe your neighborhood as well. People started seeing that, that space in a different way. They started occupying that space. They started using that space in a different way. Um, it, people, I probably like a broken record. If you've been listening to me over the last three years, I've been saying over and over and over again, we don't have any sidewalks in our neighborhood here. And so it was always shared space. Um, but the difference was, is now, you know, the, the people walking, the people biking, the people walking their dogs, pushing the, the, the baby strollers and prams, they're, they're outnumbering the number of motor vehicle drivers, you know, in the space. And so it reinforces that concept of seeing streets in a different way. What are streets really for? And they're, they're land, they're land banks of public space is what yeah. streets are. Yeah. And, you know, our imagination is the limit of how streets can be used. And, you know, we have examples now from around the world of, you know, from, you know, African, Asian, European streets uh, for America to look at Vancouver, BC streets. You know, we we need to, to reimagine streets at this point. I think yeah. it's imperative for, for the climate. It's imperative for our public health. It's imperative for our kind of equity, uh, you know, making sure that everybody has equal access to streets. And we have all of this land that is, I think, being badly used. Yeah. And that gets right to your point. <laughs> the 10 recommendations of, of, you know, build the streets for the future you want, not the present you have. That's, you know, that's it in a nutshell. Yeah. You know, I mean, everything else I learned through the car master plan had to do with like cars and asphalt and the shocking things I learned about them. But but bottom line is, yes, we want we want streets um, to, to be something different. now. it's time. It's time to change them. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we can zoom in a little bit on on some of these. We see, you know, regulate these monsters <laughs> in, in terms of what we've got out there. Impound those lawless vehicles. Uh, invest in e-bikes. Thank you very much there. And uh, on drivers, again, we're, we're working on creating some control mechanism to those entitled, entitled drivers, helping the habitual drivers, uh, making micromobility the easy choice, uh, popping over to streets. Again, our spaces build streets for kids. No, really build them for kids <laughs> and uh, measure what you value. Talk a little bit more about measuring what you value. So this is something, you know, given my, my background, I'm very interested in getting really accurate statistics about how we are using, you know, the, the money we have, the space we have, and, you know, the climate impacts of, of those policies that we have. I think a lot of city plans actually talk about what their values are, but mm -hmm. they rarely do the follow-up of measuring how those values have been applied. And, and that's something that I, you know, started to tease out. I mean, I could only do so much as a, you know, one person working on a car master plan. Uh, but I think cities really need and city staff really need to be looking at, you know, is the change that we made to this public space actually reducing traffic noise? Is it, you know, have, have, um, you know, receipts for businesses gone up? Is it, our streets more livable now? How do we, how do we define livability and what are we measuring with livability? And are we being equitable in our, our both to individuals? Are we providing for those 40% of people who don't drive? And are we actually being equitable in, in how we're splitting up the streets for the various modes at this point who are using it and various other uses of streets? We, we're not measuring those things. We're, you know, we do some bicycle counts. We occasionally you know, look at traffic speeds, but we're not getting into the into the nitty gritty of, of how we're creating a human environment in the largest public space we have in every city, which is the streets. Yeah. I like to say, uh, show me your budget and I'll tell you what your where your values are. You're absolutely right there. And yeah. in streets also show me the, the space allocation and yeah. I'll show you where your values are as well. Yeah. And number nine is uh, fund some of those changes by actually charging fair prices. Yeah, especially in downtowns. I mean, the, yep. you know, the value of 
property of, a, you know, an apartment building or a condo or a business is quite high. And yet the, the value that the street takes from, from a downtown is hardly ever charged. Driveway use is not charged. Parking spa- spaces in Portland are charged, I don't know, $2. And I don't know because I don't park here, but I think it's around $2 an hour in front of really busy places. You know, I mean, the 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 use of streets just generally is 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 severely under under underpriced, and I think people charge you know are 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 afforded access to our shared public space and are paying a real cost for using it, then we'll use it in different ways. Yeah. Am I missing number ten? Uh, no, it's right there. You just scroll Boom, out of it. That is number 10. It's the one in bold. It's the one I read first. <laughs> Build the streets for the future you want, not the present you have. Number 10. I love it. it. I That's love it. it. Kathy, is there anything that we haven't talked about yet that you want to make sure we cover? I mean, obviously, we weren't able to go through the entire master plan. So, I mean, you know, obviously, you know, I mean, I recommend people look at the section on asphalt because we should all know what asphalt is made of and how, how climate impactful and how, um, how much of our, our land is covered with asphalt. That's one thing. And then the other is cars themselves. I think very deliberately car manufacturers have put blinders on us to not see cars as, as physical items. Uh, and I mean that in the sense of, of the material that goes, you, yeah, you pulled up that slide. I mean, isn't that surprising to you? Did you look at it that is. slide? I, I, I had heard about mica, but I didn't realize how much mica was in cars. Everything. Yeah. And, you know, this is one element in a car, right? Of course, cars, you know, 74% metal. Where does that metal come from? You know, all of the rubber, the plastic and rubber that's recycled. Recycled means it's burned, right? It goes up into the atmosphere. That is hardly burned, you know, recycled, toxic fluids but I, I highlighted one of the minerals that's in a car it's in paint it's in electronics and you know maybe there's only you know in one of your four thousand pound cars there's only a couple of pounds of mica but it's but but we have you know 18 million cars on the road and you know two pounds per you know we're starting to talk about real levels of, of you know mineral extraction mined by these kids right I mean, it's shocking, you know, and I think that, you know, people who drive, you know, are often, you know, if we call ourselves environmentalists or, you know, compassionate human beings, we're concerned about, you know, resources that we are using and extracting. And we pay a lot of attention, you know, when we look at our our phones, you know, what materials are going in here. This is a, you know, a four ounce thing. A car is a four thousand pound thing. And it has similar levels of stuff, you know, of, 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 you know, mica, which is, is criminally extracted, but also, you know, the, the impacts of all of that, that material, a lot of which cannot be recycled uh, and what it's having, the impact it's having on our, on our world and on, on people, on people's lives. And that was a huge surprise to me. Again, I think it's very deliberate on the part of automakers. You know, the thing that makes the shiny paint on cars is mica. You know, yeah. that's how it's shiny and durable is yeah. mica. And, and then it's it's also, it, you mentioned there, it's also embedded in a lot of the electronics as well. So, right. And it causes, yeah. you know, silicosis in the kids that are mining it in, in Pakistan and India. I mean, yeah. you know, it makes you rethink driving. Yeah. Sure does. <laughs> so what can people do? I mean, you, you've been at this game for a long time. I've been at this game for a long time. Um, I'm just a couple years behind you. I think I've been at it for 31, 32 years now. Um, any advice, any sage advice that you have for, for people listening to this are, you know, motivated to make change happen at their level, at their block level, at their community level within their city. What advice do you have? Well, I mean, I think planners and policymakers, I really do want you to start looking at cars, at, at measuring the impact of cars, at paying attention to the things that, you know, are really going 
into your streets rather than just sort of working around cars as the background noise in your, in your plans. Uh, as far as activists and advocates, I mean, it's informing your, your politicians about this, voting for people that, that kind of get that and are, are willing to make that change. And then just, you know, as, you know I, as we said, most of the people who are listening to this are going to be in that kind of reluctant driver category or maybe non-driver of choice, which is a very small category. Um, you need to, to be reaching out and reaching to, to people who are habitual drivers and providing them with, with information about how to change their habits. Uh, I think that might be the most useful thing you can be doing as a, a kind of an individual thing. And then, you know, and a, at, a, at a larger level, find organizations or create organizations that can start voting for and changing the discussion about how streets are used. I, you know, there's a lot of a lot of room for change, and it's 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 so important to make that change immediately. Uh, our climate depends on it. Our, our the health of our country and the health of our world depend on it, and we can make that change to at least a 25% mode shift by bike and and using streets as places for people. Uh, but we can only make that change if we elect the people in positions of power who can step up and do that work. Uh, we have to elect mayors like the mayor of, of Ponte Vedra uh, and re-elect them. Uh, so this, again, this, this man uh, was elected uh, five times. And, you know, if we have a, a person that has that as a priority to make places for people to, to ensure that our habitat is, is actually habitable, uh, we have to keep on putting them back into power. Yeah. And I would probably just reemphasize by saying this is possible. Absolutely. This, this happened recently. This happened in our lifetime in terms of transforming the space back to people's space. We can do this. Um, it does take political will, as is, has been demonstrated. Um, but if we want to see that behavior change, et cetera, we have to make it that is something that is truly um, meaningful, inviting, is economically successful. It, it, it has to hit these things because just blaming and shaming people, we've proven it doesn't work. Yep. Good stuff. Kathy, it has been such an honor and pleasure having you on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so much. Yeah, I so enjoyed meeting you and I, I loved our conversation. I appreciate it. Thank you all so much for tuning into this episode with Kathy Tuttle. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, uh, please remember to give it a thumbs up and leave a comment down below. And if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the channel. Uh, it really helps out a great deal. And uh, I certainly do appreciate it. Uh, and be sure to ring that notifications bell right next to the subscribe button. That gives you the ability to customize your notifications so that when I produce new content, you get alerted. Um, and course, I have to mention, uh, please consider supporting me out on Patreon. Uh, it's how I am able to create this content and keep it coming to you. So uh, anything that you can uh, do to support my effort, uh, whether it's a dollar a month, $5 a month, $25 a month, hey, every little bit helps and it really is greatly appreciated. Uh, it especially helps out when I start uh, traveling, getting out to other uh, locations to do in-person interviews and profiles of the infrastructure out there, uh, especially around North America that is starting to transform and change. And again, I'll be in Colorado at the end of August into the beginning of September, uh, looking to profile some stuff on the ground in Fort Collins, Boulder, and Denver, as well as filming two open streets events up in Fort Collins. So again, your, your support uh, out there on Patreon really does help enable me to be able to do that. Uh, also, head on over to the Active Town store. Uh, again, we've got uh, some fun streets for people, merchandise out there. Uh, again, don't make a ton of money with it, but it is an opportunity to help offset uh, my expenses of being able to produce this content and it's greatly appreciated. And again, I hope you have been enjoying this content that I've been producing. Uh, I've been putting out two podcast episodes per week for some time now. Uh, that's gonna be coming to an end in August when I hit uh, episode number 150, the final episode 
episode of season three. So hang tight, we're gonna get to that point. And then in season four, uh, there'll be a whole new format. I'll tell you more about that as we get closer. That's it for this episode. Thank you so much for tuning in and for whatever support you're able to provide. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride and I'm incredibly grateful. Well, until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. 